Hello out there. So here's the thing. Um, over the years, a lot of people have asked me questions uh, about what are your favorite original game-based drinks that you've ever made. And I never have an answer ready because I've made a lot of this show. And actually on top of that, I bet a lot of you are, uh, might be new to the show. I've been making it for like seven years and you have not seen every episode. I wouldn't expect you to, that's crazy. Since I never have an answer ready for that, I thought it would be useful, at least, if not fun, to put together an answer and put together a bunch of my favorite episodes based on or inspired by games. So, enjoy! And if you like this kind of thing, if this works well, we'll do more of this in the future. Okay, on with the show! Let's go with Rebecca first. Rebecca is one of the main characters in Cyberpunk Edge Runners. She has a really iconic look. I, I thought about her eyes a lot when I was working on this drink, right? And they're like red and green ringed. I'm coming to why that is a component of how I got here. And I also thought about how she how she bites it in Cyberpunk Edge Runners. And if you haven't seen that, you should. And if you haven't seen that, here comes a spoiler. She bites it by being smashed into the earth by Adam Smasher, one of the legendary bad guys in all of the cyberpunk lore who somehow manages to just stay alive for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I'm going to make a drink called the Rebecca Smash. I have to pat myself on the back just a little bit and saying that a Rebecca Smash for the Rebecca who was smashed to death by Adam Smasher, pretty good. I think I got it there. So a smash typically involves crushed or sliced lemons instead of lemon juice. So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to throw four of them wedges right here into my small tin. I'm going to put in six to eight mint leaves. This mint is amazing though, by the way. This is mint we got at the grocery store. This is my new system for keeping mint fresh. It's called Shocking the Mint. I should almost do like an episode or maybe a short about that or something. Maybe I'll do it on TikTok, I don't know. It's unbelievable. It's a process by which you can shock the mint and it will stay fresh for like a week, just like this, non-refrigerated. So it's pretty pretty damn neat. Although the water apparently does get kind of murky. Maybe use uh, something that's not clear for that purpose. Six to eight mint leaves. So I originally worked up this recipe using some cherry hearing and also some simple. I have since reworked it to use a cherry simple syrup that I made. I will tell you how easy this is to make. I got the tart cherry juice from Trader Joe's. Uh, I mixed it one part tart cherry juice to two parts sugar by weight, and I cooked them to a boil and it made a delicious cherry syrup. So I think that's three quarters of an ounce of this and uh, two ounces of whiskey. Uh, I happen to have this bottle of Akashi Japanese whiskey. I grabbed this because we had it and because it seems really on point for our setting and our everything about cyberpunk. Uh, we're gonna use two ounces. The thing I think you should know about Japanese whiskey is that unless I'm mistaken and they've suddenly recently changed it like in the past year, there's like no rules governing what Japanese whiskey is. So like a lot of it is splendid scotch that they buy in Scotland and then import and rebottle. Um, some of it might be bourbon, whatever. That's not universally true. Some of the Japanese whiskey brands are are very uh, above board, like Nika, for example, I think is one that you can really trust. Um, I don't actually know anything about this. I just happen to have the bottle and I thought it would be a great thematic choice. So we're gonna use it. You should use the whiskey you like. Uh, and if you like this thematic choice, I'm pretty sure this will be available at Curiata, drink.curiata.com. Two ounces, there we go. At that point now, I'm going to muddle. Okay, there we go. We've muddled our lemons and our whiskey and our mint and our cherries all together. Yum, yum, yummity dum. We're gonna shake this over ice. One in there, crack it. Boy, is fresh ice easier to work with, Jesus. I know that sounds stupid, but it really does make a difference. That frost on the outside that builds up over ice and on ice in a freezer can really interfere with my ability to crack it. <laughs> there we go. It's gonna try to go into this little trap, this uh, diamond glass if possible. I've got my uh, neat future glass here. Um, even though this is a smash, I am going to strain it into that glass. Cyberpunk, one of the rules is that uh, style is everything. Style over function, form over function. I'm gonna take a little Midori and we're gonna sink it into the bottom there, just for an effect. Got those green and red things going on with our, our Rebecca in her eyes. Hit it with a little bit of mint that in there. And there it is, the Rebecca. I do think this drink goes with a straw. So there we are, the Rebecca, as I believe it should be served at the afterlife. I can't speak. So with the thing with the straw is right now I'm in the Midori. Um, you want to moderate that, right? You can take your straw up and down and sample from different depths and get different mixtures of Midori and also of the rest of the cocktail. That's great. That is cool. That is a really well-balanced 
tart, minty, cherry y, uh, whiskey y smash. And actually, you get little hints of the Midori kind of complementing the mint, which I know it's just they're just green together, but they do actually really seem to work off of each other really well. The Midori adds this twist to it, this extra little bit of roundness, this roundness, this extra sweetness. It's almost apple-ish, but I know it's a melon liqueur. I don't want to just tell you it tastes like melon. It does taste like melon, but I somehow feel like that's not enough of a descriptor. Um, specifically, I think it's like a kind of a, a honeydewish flavor, by the way, as opposed to like a watermelon or a cantaloupe. I don't know any other melons, by the way. Ah, Rebecca, we hardly knew you. I've had a lot of requests for a drink called Perca Cola from Call of Duty Black Ops. They were introduced actually in Call of Duty World at War Map Pack 2, the map pack that introduced Call of Duty Zombies with the map Verrucht, which uh, I think is German for mental asylum. Verrucht. Um, they are bioengineered enhancements that come in the form of colas or sodas, actually. So there were originally only four, uh, Juggernog, Speed Cola, Quick Revive, and Double Tap Root Beer. I am gonna make those four today. There's now, I think, 30, there's a lot now. Um, that would be the subject of a bigger episode than I am prepared to do. Uh, what I got to make help me out here was I picked up a crate of what are called mini champagne bottles. These are 6.3 fluid ounce or 187 milliliter bottles. And uh, I got some, you know, homemade label printer paper and we made some nice labels for these. And you can see that's a speed cola there. And so I'm gonna serve these drinks in these bottles. That should really, uh, that should sell it. I think that'll work. What am I going off of to base these drinks on? Um, a little bit the appearance that I have seen of them. I don't know how many games the physical actual drinks appear in. It seems like they're they're less, it's more like you just interact with the machine. But from what I can gather from the appearance I'm going off of, um, I'm trying to pull a little bit of inspiration from their name. Uh, I think that in the case of Quick Revive, there's a character who says that it tastes like fish, but it's blue. I'm not making a blue drink that tastes like fish. We're just gonna make it nice, it'll be good. I'm just gonna go in the order I wrote these in. We're gonna start with Juggernog. Now, Juggernog, it's an interesting one. I had to think about that. It's red, it's called Juggernog. Uh, what does that mean, Nog? Because it's usually think of an eggnog. I looked it up, uh, apparently the etymology of the word is that Nog is an East Anglian word that originally meant a very strong ale. Okay, so it doesn't have to just be a Nog. Uh, we're gonna go for a cinnamon base here. Well, one ounce of cinnamon syrup. Half an ounce of Campari. And two ounces of Luxardo's Sour Cherry Gin. Stir that up over some ice and then we'll funnel it into the bottle, add seltzer and cap it. And we'll put the Juggernog bottle here. I'm gonna funnel that in. I will carefully top that up with some very cold soda. Oh, 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 that's the opposite of careful. I'll do that. I'm gonna cap that with a red cap. And there we have our Juggernog. See if I feel like I'll take twice as many bullets to the face after I drink this. Gotta be honest, be honest, I don't feel like I'm gonna take more bullets to the face now. I do really like this. There's an interesting thing that happens here where it starts out with this like a bracing bitter kind of Campari thing that gives way to a vanilla sort of thing happening. That's it's quite enjoyable actually. Um, beautiful. I, I I'm, couldn't be happier with the way this came out. These are all very simple drinks at the end of the day. They're just a few things and, and seltzer. They're basic highballs, really. Let's make a sunrise parabellum. It's a line of dialogue from near the end of the game. I don't really want to give you the context in which it happens. It is a expression that Kim Kitsuragi explains means prepare for war, wake up, parabellum, parabellum being a nine millimeter round. Sunrise, parabellum, get up and fight. So let's make that drink, right? So I wanted something that would get you up so it's got to have some coffee in it. And I want to accentuate that coffee. And I'm on this kick right now where coffee, orange, and chartreuse really go well together. So that's like my magic triptych for coffee stuff right now. <laughs> in addition to that, I wanted it to have kind of like a smoky thing in it that would proof it up 
and makes it feel like gunpowder smoke, gun smoke. So that's how I came up with this Sunrise Parabellum. Oh, and absent. All right, let's make this Sunrise Parabellum. So the first thing I need is my mixing glass. I'm gonna try this brand new one I got. This is a paddle mixing glass from Cocktail Kingdom and it's really, really pretty. I really like the way it looks. The first ingredient is half an ounce of simple syrup. Three quarters of an ounce now of orange liqueur. I like to use dry curacao. There you go. Half an ounce of chartreuse. People always ask me, do you mean green or yellow? I would specify yellow if I meant yellow. Chartreuse is chartreuse. Green chartreuse is just chartreuse. Yellow chartreuse is yellow chartreuse. One and a half ounces of our Mr. Black. That's your coffee. Now for a little secret ingredient. This is also, by the way, very excessive, very extra. 12 year Isla single malt scotch from Bonabin. I think by this point in the game, you deserve the good stuff. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Bunaben, uh, Bunaben, Bunhaben, Bunaben, Bunaben. Probably it's just Bunaben. I think it's Bunaben. Half an ounce of this. Let's crack some ice and stir it up. That's ready to pour. I wasn't really sure which glass I was going to serve it in. I think we're going to go with the double old fashioned though. I like an absinthe rinse in this drink, uh, and you could rinse it or you could use an atomizer like this and just spritz it in. Whoa, it's a powerful atomizer. That's awesome. That looked really cool. Ooh, it's a lovely smell. And away we pour. Presents a little bit like a Sazerac. And I strongly encourage you to garnish this with a flamed orange peel. Ooh. Oh. Get the rest of it out, and I'm just gonna leave it in there. And there it is, the Sunrise Parabellum. <laughs> there are a few drinks I love this much. Oh man, I forgot how good this was. It is a quick shot of smoke and salt and iodine, and then just this sweet, magic coffee that's married with a delicious orange thing and this herbal spicy peppery note that kind of lingers up above it. Oh man, honestly, one of my favorite tricks I've ever made for the show. I love what the absinthe is doing in that coffee. Might not be for everybody, I love it. The chartreuse plus the coffee. I mean, coffee, I found out so much about coffee recently because we did this episode with the Pousse Cafe in it. Never had such a thing before, but it allows you to sample coffee with a bunch of different liqueurs as you go. One of which was chartreuse. Coffee and chartreuse are like pure magic together. You don't need a lot of chartreuse. But something happens with the tangy kind of nutty acidity of coffee when you lengthen it with a little chartreuse. You get this third flavor, this new flavor. It's magic. It is a truly wonderful thing. I, maybe I'm crazy, but for me. It's all the flavors. It is spicy in a black pepper kind of way. It is smoky, salty, a little iodine-y, very hinty, very just on the edges. You've got that licorice note, you've got the coffee, and they all come through almost in a perfect cadence, you know? It's not like it's all at once. It's ba-dump, ba-dump, ba-dump. The coffee gives way to like a chocolatey, a sweet chocolatey, like a Terry's orange ball. You know, you get that orange chocolate coffee flavor all together. And that's really kind of where it finishes. Now, is this the kind of thing that an officer is gonna make up in the trenches? Oh God, no, 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 no. This is a very complicated, elevated version of whatever they may have drank as a little liquid courage before they're going up and over. But uh, hot damn, is this a uh, drink that I can really get behind? I would love to hear about some people making this one out there. This is the David Martinez from Cyberpunk Edge Runners. So named for the main character, David Martinez, who runs around with a San Devastan doing all kinds of crazy shit. That drink in the game, the recipe that's given, a shot of vodka and a splash of neat cola on, on the rocks. The thing is, the image for it, it's very blue and there's yellow floating in it, gold floating in it. And what's funny is I was thinking, vodka isn't blue, vodka isn't yellow. How do I get that yellow thing in it? And I built this drink and I said, it needs a lemon twist. Oh, there's the yellow thing. <laughs> it's like, so dumb. Uh, and then the garnish for it is a katana 
with like a snake wrapped around it. I saw like um, somebody on a Reddit post saying, oh, it's just a, a vodka soda with a chili pepper garnish. And I could see why they thought that because from like tiny little bitmappy thing, it kind of just looks like the snake coil just sort of looks like two purplish reddish chili peppers. But if you blow that up a lot, you can see that it is in fact a snake. I don't have a cool snake. I ordered some cool snakes. I don't know when Etsy's gonna deliver. We're, we're going snakeless. We're going no snake. It's gonna be fine. And so what I need is one ounce of this rapidly coagulating violet syrup. Use violet flowers, use a violet extract if you have time. Don't go buying Choward's violet candies because there's some kind of caking agent in them that you cannot stop. You can't stop. <laughs> Might be good to stop grievous bleeding. <laughs> You know, if a serious bodily wound, you might be able to stop it with powdered Choward's violets. That'd be a very cyberpunk thing. Half an ounce of Ni Cola Original. Two ounces of vodka. We're gonna use Gary's Good Vodka. Yes, yeah, the vodka of the moment. We do want that to be blue, so I'm gonna add one or two drops of blue devil food dye that's just spraying me with food dye. I'm going to kind of dry stir that just to incorporate them without any ice. It's a shame that it's like, clouding up like this. It was totally clear when it came off the stove. And that's not quite blue enough, so I'm gonna add a couple more drops because I really want it to look like the picture in the game. That's blue. Uh, you know, this is the alcoholic version, right? So I could have used blue curacao or something, right? The thing of it is, is that I want all of the parts that are the soda to be non-alcoholic. So now I need an ice cube. Three ounces of carbonated water. This drink needs a twist of lemon over the top of it to be complete. Really needs that extra little jazz with lemon. Boom, very nice. And then that one isn't big enough, so I cut another big piece of peel. I'm going to put it through this neat little katana pick I have. There we go. There we have the David Martinez, as I imagine it must be served at the afterlife in Cyberpunk 2077, Edge Runner's Netflix show. Here we go. That's lovely. It's floral and fizzy and alcoholic. The twist of lemon, that's a really big factor in this drink. It's almost like an old fashioned because that, that sets off the violet so well. You need that twist of citrus, uh, particularly in an alcoholic beverage. It just, it, it wakes it up. It adds another dimension to that floral nature. I know it doesn't look like much, that little bit of oil, but boy, does it do a lot in a drink like this, you know? And the violet is unique. It's novel. I don't know. I can't think of any other drinks that are violet. There's creme de violet. You don't use it a lot. Why didn't I use it here? Again, because the blue in this drink the violet flavor is coming from a soft drink. It's not coming from the alcoholic component. The only alcoholic component that should be in this drink is the vodka, so says the game. So that's what this is, a Chaos Reigns. It's gonna be a good Midori Sour. Uh, we're gonna add a quarter ounce of simple syrup to this. One ounce of lime juice goes into the matin. Uh, next I need an ounce of Midori, a historic and stalwart staple of taverns all across Exandria. And now I want an ounce and a half of like a really mild light rum. There's no reason you, I guess, couldn't use vodka here if you prefer, but even like a silver Bacardi is gonna have a lot more character. Ounce and a half. Need an egg. We're gonna put an egg white in here, which checks out because chickens are dinosaurs. If you prefer to avoid egg whites, I did a whole episode exploring those options. I'm gonna cut to the chase though and just tell you that aquafaba is your best bet. Um, anyway, one egg white or one ounce of aquafaba. This egg is boiled. Man, it's perfect too. I mean, I kinda, I'm, I'm hungry for lunch. That's pretty good. Well, let's hope the rest of my eggs aren't boiled. I really need my wife to label those better. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. And I'm gonna give that a dry shake. And some ice, let's get some ice in there. Get a nice sour glass or whatever you prefer to drink it out of. I have yet to meet a sour that wasn't improved by a few dashes of bitters on its top here. So I think Angostura worked really well with this one. I should stick with what I know. I'm gonna do dots. Get your uh, cocktail pick, put a little swirl in that. There you go, that looks, that looks intentional. It has a really great, almost glowing green hue to it, honestly, and a really cool transition from this white to this green bottom. I'm very pleased with the way it looks in this glass. I haven't actually put it in this glass yet. Uh, let chaos rain. Oh, I love that. That's really good. The Midori can easily overpower something. Here it is not overpowering at all. It is really, um, I think, well-balanced. It has a very light floral, I don't know if floral's the right word. It's a lightly fruited flavor. It tastes um, citrusy and limey and green, almost like a key lime pie, a little drier than that, not that, not quite that sweet. 
You get a lot of character. I mean, I think this is true of all sours, and I think that they all benefit from having some Angostura or Peixos bitters on their frothy tops, right? You do get a lot of character and a lot of flavor there. So you get a lot of cinnamon, a lot of just evolution, a lot of uh, rooty, earthy, um, kind of Christmassy notes, you know, from that. And it works really well here. Very, very fresh tasting, very easy to drink. Um, plenty of character and evolution, really great texture. The egg white froths really well here. I actually really like this drink. I think it came out perfect. Hell yeah, the Chaos Rain. I think the Traveler would approve. All right, well, I mentioned that there's another drink in that same scene. I am, of course, talking about Ruby of the Sea. Now, this drink is named for Jester's mother, Marion Lavore. I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of Exandria or anything, but I did some research, and one of the things I uncovered is that Nicodronus, their bear claws, are heavily flavored with cinnamon. And I thought that that might be an indication that this drink would favor cinnamon as a flavor. The other thing I was going off of was the idea of it being red because of Marion and the ruby thing, and maybe being tiki-ish. And that led me to considering the Pearl Diver as a bit of an inspiration because there's a tiki drink named for a gem. Pearl, does a pearl count as a gem? I don't know if that counts as a gem. I don't, maybe it's an anomaly from an oyster. It's valuable, it's a precious, it's a precious wart. Ruby of the sea, pearl diver, uh, that kind of works in my brain. And at some point while working on this, the idea of it being red went out the window and I decided it should actually be blue, like the sea with a ruby in it. The first thing you'll need to make this drink is a cinnamon honey syrup. Now I've made and used cinnamon and honey syrups a lot in the past, but I've never made a cinnamon honey syrup before now. So basically the same rules apply as when making a honey syrup. This is just two parts honey to one part water. Why do you make a honey syrup? You make a honey syrup because honey doesn't pour and honey syrup does. So it makes it much easier to work with in a bar. But then to that, I added a number of cinnamon sticks. I actually did uh, like 230 grams of water with 460 grams of honey and then six cinnamon st sticks. And I threw that into a pan and I heated it until it was simmering to help the cinnamon sticks express a little bit. And then I kind of like simmered it real low for about five or 10 minutes or something like that. And then just let it cool like that for a while. Then I bottled it with three cinnamon sticks, right? So it should keep getting more and more cinnamon. And the result is, well, honey, cinnamon, syrup. So um, we're gonna need that to make this drink. So get your shaker or your mixing tin or whatever you're gonna make this drink in, a blender, whatever your preference is. And we're gonna put an ounce of the honey cinnamon syrup in it. Um, and the reason honey is because, well, Pearl Diver is sweetened with a honey mix uh, called Gardenia mix that has butter and like a lot of other flowers and uh, things added to it. This is inspired by a Pearl Diver. It's not quite a Pearl Diver. Um, so we're going to go with honey anyway. Okay, I'm gonna follow that up with a half an ounce of lime juice. And now a half an ounce of blue curacao, another Exandrian tavern staple. They love their blue curacao in Exandria. And now uh, I would like an ounce and a half of El Dorado three-year rum. And now I need half an ounce of Ray and Nephew Jamaican overproof rum because Marion Lavore does not play around. So I've got my Pearl Diver glass at the ready. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put some crushed ice in here and we're gonna flash blend it for about 15 seconds. If you want to go um, in a shaker, you know, just shake with crushed ice or whatever and do an open pour. Uh, blender, just put it in there with some broken ice and blend it until you like it. I pre-crushed my ice because it's an annoying waste of time not to. Perfect. Ten seconds felt about right. Do an open pour into a pearl diver glass or the glass of your choice. Also, I just want to throw out there too, by the way, that if you want to make these drinks at home, why don't you drop by drink.curiata.com. You know, they serve most of the people who live in the continental United States. They can deliver spirits straight to your door. We have a partnership going with them. Uh, helps me out, helps you out. Okay, give it a try. All right, moving on. Now I'm gonna garnish that with a maraschino cherry. Now in nearly any other drink, I would prefer a really kind of a nice Luxardo Maraschino cherry, right? But we really want some intense color here. Uh, and so I'm going with a much more standard, uh, you know, Maraschino cherries of the uh, of the Coca-Colas of your youth, right? Maraschino, I should say, really. We're talking about American style. And I think that there we have it, the ruby of the sea. Put a straw in there and let's see how it is. Oh yeah. The combination of honey and cinnamon with that Jamaican rum, which is, you know, the, the, the El Dorado is there as a background flavor, but that half ounce of Ray and Nephew really punches through. I always say this, that honey has a slightly tangy or metallic flavor. I don't know how to describe the flavor of honey. Honey tastes like honey, but it latches on to the funky notes in that Jamaican rum and they kind of synthesize into something that is quite wonderful here and cinnamony. 
I'm very pleased with the way this came out. This is a good tiki drink. The lime is not cutting through the drink. I didn't want it to. I have that kind of kept to a half an ounce here just to help balance it. I don't want it to taste lime forward. You could try it with more lime, but I don't think it would help. The honey and cinnamon, I wanted them to lead in this drink a little bit because that's sort of the unique parts of the flavor profile here, right? They get together with that Jamaican rum, the funky Ray and Nephew, and they make something, I don't know, it's really cool. I don't think I've had anything quite like it. It's eminently drinkable, very tasty, fun to look at, and I think it looks right too. It looks like, hey, Ruby in the Sea. I hope that works, right? Ruby in the Sea, see, Ruby in the Sea, Ruby of the Sea. R Ruby, Ruby of the Sea, you get it? get it? We're gonna make a full biotic kick and I'm gonna start with the glass. I'm gonna drink it out of, in this case, this sphere because it feels really science fiction-y. I don't think that in the game that they drink it out of a sphere, but why shouldn't they? I will approximately fill this glass with cracked ice. It's gonna be tricky to do that. We're gonna give our best shot. Like I'm a pro or something, right? There you go. Get it in there. Perfect. No complaints. To that, I want to add one ounce of Amaro de Angostura. Amara. That's really good stuff, by the way. I love Amaro de Angostura. It's cool and uh, probably available on Curiata, by the way, if you wanted to pick that up. It's at drink.curiata.com. Check it out in the link below. Everything I use in this episode should be available up there, or at least an analog to it. Certainly, if you're following along at home, they've got the stuff that I use in the How to Drink collection. Now I want to use uh, two ounces of bourbon. And I'm gonna use this Yellowstone Select because there's, I like it, it's good bourbon. I should use a funnel with this kind of glass, maybe. It's a little tricky. I, I, I did not count on how like awkward this would be to pour into. Could I stir it? Sure, I could stir it a little. I don't think it's gonna be necessary though because we're about to top it up with some cold ginger beer. Use the ginger beer you like. If you wanna make your own, you can. We've done that on the show today. I haven't really used it much. That's actually not even the ginger beer I used to test this recipe, but it should not matter. I'm gonna use Q ginger beer. Let's see how it is. It's perfect. It's very dry, very gingery. That'll be great. Hot and spicy. Not very sweet at all, very low sugar. I mean, honestly, you might want something with a little more sugar than that. Anyway, I'm gonna to top it up with about four ounces of this spicy ginger beer. And since this glass is a sphere, I'm not gonna to try to eyeball it too much. Boom. And now we need to pull a peel from an orange. Yeah, and I think it'll be fun to do a really long one. Almost treat this like a horse's neck. I'm gonna give that a little twist here. I guess you could twist the whole thing, what the heck. It's a little bit over its top and see if it looks neat and science fiction-y kind of floating around the inside of my glass. I hope it does. Yeah, that kind of works. If your glass has a lid, you wanna screw that down at this point and then put the plastic straw in there. There it is, the full biotic kick. My favorite drink on the Citadel. Eh, uh, eh? Uh, let's see how it came out. Yeah, I like this a lot. I do think that actually this might be a place where you would want maybe a slightly sweeter ginger beer. When I was working this out, I was using a different ginger beer on my recipe and I think there was a little bit more sugar in it. I'm gonna do something silly. I'm gonna taste it like this and I'm gonna put in like a couple bar spoons and see if how it improves it. This is basically a, a bourbon mule, right? Like it's a Kentucky mule, but with a weird twist in it, which is coming from the Angostura, um, Amaro de Angostura. There's a lot of the Angostura notes in there, but with this kind of elongated flavor profile, it's a little less uh, pungent, but still present. And with also these herbal notes, kind of like a Benedictine, it gives this drink a very unique character without overpowering or being overpowered by the ginger beer or the bourbon. Everybody is present and it tastes to me familiar and yet very different. Like something I've never, like not quite ever had and good, enjoyable. So I feel like this is exactly what I wanted to do with this drink. I do think that the Q, now that I'm actually using that, why did we switch? Why? Because I had two cans left of this other ginger beer, uh, Jamaica something or other, and I needed more. And what they had at the grocery store was the Q. The Jamaica stuff was definitely had a little bit higher sugar qu qu quotient. And I think that maybe, I'm gonna put a link, I have to find out what brand it was. But I do think that like um, a couple brands would be fine. I'll put them in the links below. I actually think this one is not the one to use. I think we wanna put a little bit more sweetness in here. Just a little, well, maybe a lot. And just stir that up. When I was working on this recipe a little earlier ago with a little sweeter ginger beer, the um, Amaro was much rounder and present in a very pleasant way. And I think it just needs that drop of sweetness to kind of kind of live in harmony in this drink much better. It helps it a lot. And you still get plenty of, I mean, honestly, I think it's spicier. I think that the ginger spice now 
has a longer and more pronounced evolution. It comes in later, which leaves a lot of room for the Amaro and bourbon to kind of round out the flavor. Oh man, it's really now, sorry, I, I didn't think I was gonna have more to say about this drink, but I do. Now there's really this wonderful thing that's happening here where the orange and maybe this, I've stirred it a little bit more. The orange is really getting in there. That orange oil is getting into that Amaro and they are linking up in a really delicious way. And that's kind of where this drink is leading from. And then it goes into the bourbon, which, man, what is the bourbon in here? Honestly, I've had, now I've got so much ginger beer burn. I'm having a little bit of a hard time pulling the bourbon apart now. But I think that in this, in this mix, you're getting quite a bit of bubblegum and vanilla, actually, um, off of that bourbon. And then, of course, we move right into whew, ginger beer, spicy, burning, delicious, sexy? Is ginger beer sexy? Spicy, burning, delicious, sexy ginger beer? Yeah, why not? Sexy ginger beer. Very enjoyable. Really fun drink. And leaves you with a nice ginger burn. Okay, so thankfully that is over. And I can move it right along here. Um, I mentioned the Awoken before, and so let's head back to them. Now, 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 the Awoken are a matriarchal society led by the Queen Marasov, who, uh, frankly, I just find her a bit suspicious, but maybe that's me, I don't know. Uh, and they have this, this uh, secret city that's outside of time, and they call it the Dreaming City. It's a, it's, this is a broken, cursed place where time just repeats the same three weeks on a loop forever, which coincidentally makes for pretty good game, gameplay, it turns out. That's just a funny coincidence there. As a guardian, you gotta go there and help out the Awokens or something. And uh, to do that, you're gonna need access to the Ascendant Realms, which are pocket dimensions powered by pure darkness. And to get there, to get there, well, you're just gonna need to see yourself some little tears in reality. And to do that, you will probably definitely need to drink up some magic space drugs, okay? I didn't make the rules here, Bungie did. And the stuff I'm talking about is Tincture of Queen's Foil. Now, in the game, this thing only exists as a little icon in your inventory, so far as I know. Uh, anyway, I have pulled some screen grabs and I looked real close, okay? What we've got here... <laughs> now, what we've got here it was a failure to communicate. Now, what we've got here is a semi-luminescent teal blue liquid with tendrils of darkness sort of suspended and coursing through it, trying to escape the vial. I'm not gonna lie, that is not easy to achieve in a cocktail. I worked on this one quite a bit to find something that would both look correct and be something you would actually wanna drink. And I feel pretty good about what I've come up with, but there is a trick to this whole thing and you'll need a pretty specialized ingredient. See. I can get something dark that would float on the drink, and I can get something dark that'll sink right through a drink and sit on the bottom. But to hang out in the middle, like tendrils, and stay there while you have this drink in your hand and you're moving around, maybe at a party or whatever, that's hard. Uh, after working on this for a while, I'd found a combination of flavors that I mostly liked, but I couldn't quite get the look right. And then I started playing with just straight up manipulating the viscosity. I had some xanthan gum from Modernist Pantry, and I'm gonna put a link to this uh, below. Uh, and I tinkered with this a bit, and I arrived at a sort of non-standard use for it. See, Modernist Pantry has a pretty good formula they figured out for using this in a recipe, like for instance, hot dog relish or something. But I wanted to work with it another way, because I didn't want to make one cocktail with it, right? I needed to make something I could add to drinks. Instead, I doubled their recommended ratio, and I mixed it with water to create a pourable thickener. I can add this to any drink. This stuff in the bottle is, um, it's basically flavorless, although it's not quite colorless. That's really just kind of suspended air in there, I think, by the way. And actually, it's funny, when you shake it, you can see the air bubbles just stay where they landed. You can dilute this into a cocktail and derive it uh, at a drink that would be subtly more viscous than you'd have otherwise, which lets you do pretty neat things. So Modernist Pantry recommends using half a gram of xanthan gum to a liter of uh, fluid, at most. I used a full gram to a liter, I doubled the ratio. Uh, this is also my first real go-around with this, so maybe you all have better ratios or advice for using this stuff. Um, and also, since I know you're going to ask, why am I not just using a gum syrup and take like gum akasha and some simple syrup? Well, for one, that ties our thickeningness to sweetness. And two, gum syrup isn't really that thick, right? It's not. Um, so what would I do here? I would have to make a special version of gum syrup just for this drink that's like super over thickened. I didn't want to make an ingredient just for this drink. This is a thickener that you can add to other drinks. Um, I think it just makes more sense to make a universal thickening agent like that that can be added to any drink in small quantities 
that is divorced from sweetness, right? You want this drink to be a little thicker, a little bit more viscous, you can just do that. Um, I'll be using this a lot probably on the show. Well, I mean, I won't when I overuse it, but boy, does it solve a lot of uh, visual problems for me. So um, in my mixing glass, I'm gonna do a half an ounce of simple. A half an ounce of my thickener. And you can see it pours easily. It's not like glue, right? A quarter ounce of blue curacao. Um, and honestly, you might even be able to get away with a little bit even less than that, but we'll do a quarter. Half an ounce of italicus, which is a bergamot liqueur. Bergamot, uh, that's the primary ingredient, uh, the flavoring agent in a Earl Grey tea. So this is going to have that kind of a vibe. Earl Grey tea felt very appropriate for something called Queen's foil. Tincture of Queen's foil. I like that stuff, it's available on Criada. Half an ounce of citron vodka, mainly because I wanted to get some lemony flavors in here and I don't wanna use lemon juice. And an ounce and a half of a uh, dry gin. Also felt pretty appropriate for something called tincture of Queen's foil. Okay, crack some ice in there. Really a perfect glass for this. A tall highball glass. Strain that straight in, no ice. I should probably say that what I had in here is doubled, right? Like that's a huge amount for this drink. Now that we've got this in a glass, all we need to do is add our streaks of darkness. And I found Angostura bitters work the best here. Um, partially, yes, it's because they taste great in this drink, but also it's because they have a lot of pigment. Um, I tried a few different dark rums and stuff like that, black rums, nothing comes even close to this. They just kind of, everything diffuses and disappears. The trick though is to dash it down hard because uh, where it stops moving is pretty much where it's gonna stay. So I'm gonna put a few dashes in here and hopefully this looks awesome, maybe. And there we have, well, that one actually rose up a little bit, but it does have some streaks going down there. There we have our tincture of queen's foil. Honestly, I think that's cool and unique enough looking that it really doesn't need a garnish. Um, but you can see it definitely has streaks that reach all the way to the bottom. Uh, you can go more aggressive on that. You're gonna get different results every time you do this, to be perfectly honest, slightly, because there's a little bit of randomness and chaos in this. So I don't think it needs a garnish, but now let's see if it'll help me find my way into the Ascendant Drones. It doesn't. I find that pretty pleasant. Um, it does not, feel like it does have a silky texture to it, but it doesn't have like a very heavy, thick, jello-y texture to it at all. I find it very, very drinkable. It is bright and lemony. Oh, well, that bergamot, I, I love that. I just love the taste of that bergamot, that Earl Grey flavor. The gin is not a major part of the flavor profile, to be perfectly honest. It is part of the orchestra, that juniper, the herbalness to it, the little astringency that comes along with that, all of that sort of helps back it up. Would this be better with fresh lemon juice instead of the lemon vodka? But then we'd have to deal with lemon pulp being in there and stuff like that, and it would really ruin the look of the drink. But I think it's great as it is. Um, and I think it tastes, it's, it's like I said, it's an approachable, easy to drink drink. Um, your streaks will last. I mean, they're kind of fading now a little bit, but they're still in there. And you can always really kind of, go crazy with it if you want. They won't mix on their own, right? They, they will remain separated. Quite sophisticated and regal tasting. And of course, the, the Agastor Bitters is bringing a lot of um, cinnamon and um, maybe sassafras -y even on this mix, the way that what's expressing out of there, like, like root beery kind of flavors. I, I find that really enjoyable. <laughs> it's, it's cool. Um, and I think, um, I think it looks the fire which is what I was going for. Next drink, let's move it along. And there's really no way to get around the fact that in order to do this episode, which a lot of you have been asking for, I do need to spoil a plot point of the game. So if you're avoiding that, I don't know what to tell you. This is of course a spoiler that will develop in the opening six hour prologue of gameplay. And that is that, and spoiler alert, Jackie doesn't make it, it's true. He died as he lived, failing utterly to respect lanes of fire and screening my targets all the way through Arasaka Tower, eating every bullet he could find along the way. Jackie, you are the absolute worst. But his death was not in vain. He left me with this sick bike and also a recipe for a drink to celebrate his life with 
have the afterlife. Shot of vodka on the rocks, lime juice, ginger beer, oh, and most importantly, a splash of love. The drink he has described here is a Moscow Mule with a splash of love. This puts me in a tight spot, even though this is what he wanted. But the only variable that we really have to play with is which ginger beer do we use? And what is a splash of love? Let's start with the ginger beers. I ordered a bunch to test. No, not an exhaustive list. Just what I could get in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, the one with the most oomph that I could get turned out to be cock and bull. Actually, uh, cock and bull is super hot ginger beer, and that's what I was going for with this drink. So cock and bull, if you can get it, and you can, it's on Amazon, uh, is the, the way to go. Link below, by the way, for that. You can get that on Amazon, link below, money, money for me. We're living in Night City now. I gotta scrape every penny I can get, right? Okay, edge running, very important business. So the thing that's left to consider is, well, what's a splash of love? The splash of love is the other real variable here. And a bunch of people online have interpreted that to be grenadine or something else that would carry a pinkish hue. And I get that. That makes perfect sense to me. It's just not my first instinct in cases like this. Instead, this is where my head's at, I ask myself, well, what does Jackie love? When Jackie says love, what does Jackie mean? What is a splash of love to Jackie? And I think the game makes a very clear point that Jackie loved Misty. And so then my brain jumped to Irish Mist, which I have right here which is a honey liqueur that uses Irish whiskey as its base. Honey and ginger happen to also be pretty well established flavor combo. Uh, so I got to work on finding a ratio that would work. There's some really big flavors here because the ginger beer is loud and Irish mist is not messing around. It has a lot of flavor in it. It's a bit over the top, to be honest. It's not, it's not like Irish mist ain't fancy stuff. No offense to Irish mist, but you know, it's 30% ABV, 35%. Uh, it's a rich liqueur blended with Irish whiskey honey and aromatic spices. It's got a very loud flavor. It is not great, to be perfectly honest. It can be cloyingly sweet. It can be a little artificial tasting. So it's difficult to work with, but it's also not in, if you balance it, it works really well. Once I figured out that two to one cock and bowl to Irish mist worked pretty well, you could still taste both of them. If you just take like two parts, two ounces of cock and bowl and pour one ounce of Irish mist in it, you taste both of them in tandem. That to me works pretty well. From there, it was just about how much do you want to thin that out with vodka and sharpen it up with lime. So let's make the drink. I'm going to need my shaker. Uh, I'm going to combine half an ounce of lime juice. I shot one episode before this. Everybody's been speculating lately, like, oh, this is late in the filming day. That's true. It's always the last episode I filmed that day. But now that I shoot the show alone, it's very seldom that I shoot more than one episode a day, unfortunately. So this is one of the rare times when you're seeing me on the tail end of another episode. And let me tell you something, I'm feeling it. I have become an extreme lightweight in the recent months. All right, so half an ounce of lime juice, uh, one ounce of vodka, Stoli is fine. One ounce of Irish mist. So I'm gonna shake that up and pour it over some rocks uh, and we will top that up with ginger beer. I suppose I should get my glass ready. Uh, I mentioned that CDPR uh, altered the in-game look of the drink. They also sent me this, this uh, special box. And in the box, we have a drink, a glass from the afterlife. So I can think of nothing better to serve this in than this. It's just a rocks glass with afterlife, the logo from the bar kind of stenciled on it. Not stenciled, etched in like um, either laser or acid etched, probably laser. One big. The other one I will crack. I'm gonna crack another ice cube into this. Um, should it be one big cube? No, I think it should be cracked ice. So take your rocks glass, uh, which is actually pretty oversized in this case, perfect. Crack a cube in there. Some broken up ice, absolutely perfect. Throw it on your glorifier if you have one. Could I have served this over the ice that was shooken over? Sure. Could I have built it in the glass? Absolutely, all of that's totally valid. And then I wanna to top that up with some cock and bowl ginger beer. Um, I think two ounces is the way to go. Oh, it's a twist off. So I think two ounces of cock and bowl. I mean, you could also eyeball this, you know. You could do it to taste. And uh, that's it, that's a Jackie Wells. That is really refreshing. You get the honey and the ginger, they really, interplay very well. 
you actually get the honey first. Um, this, and then it goes away and it gets overtaken by ginger heat and then it comes back and then they kind of dance back and forth just like that. Vodka brings nothing to the table, vodka's vodka. Lime, um, it needs a little acid, you know? A half an ounce is just right, I think, here. You know, you don't really taste lime, but that acid kind of helps the flavors work together. I think it's great. I think that the flavors work. It is definitely balanced. It has a little something in there that is unexpected. It's definitely recognizably a Moscow Mule. It's, it's spicy, ginger, hot. Got some vodka in there, you get a little bit of lime, but the honey from the Irish Mist runs throughout this flavored honey, this somewhat artificial taste. I mean, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, right? Like, it's not like honey syrup. There's something else going on there. It's not unpleasant, but it is surprising, which is cool. It makes this drink kind of unique. Given the description, which is very restrictive, that we get from Jackie in the game, and I know you'd be complaining if I said, I'll do whatever I want. I don't know that I could come up with a better drink than this. I think it's very refreshing, it's extremely good. We're in the afterlife and our pal Jackie orders us two tequila old fashions with a splash of cerveza and the bartender calls this a Johnny Silverhand. Uh, we don't get a fantastic look at the drink in the game, but there's actually not much to see anyway. It's just sort of like a, you know, geometric glass with, with much not much that we can see in it. My only problem with this drink, the Johnny Silverhand, as it's described in the game, is that it is, it's, it's an old fashioned that you splash a beer into. I don't, what is, what is that? What's the point of that? Like a splash of beer? No question. Anyway, I, I played around with that idea a bit and I sort of had stumbled into this idea that maybe we lose the ice from the old fashioned. And then instead of just splashing beer across the top, it's a float of beer. And we do more of a 50-50 thing. So it's not a splash and it gets very much, it gets a lot closer this way to being a very refined boiler maker. It's tricky to float a beer on a cocktail. Uh, there's a lot of physics involved about specific gravity and fluid densities and stuff like that. Liquor in a cocktail is going to be less dense than most beer. Um, and so the, they're either gonna to wanna to mix and not separate very well, or the beer's gonna to wanna to sink right to the bottom. It's, it's a tricky thing to, to do. And I specifically did want this drink to have a layered look as much as possible. So while I initially thought that it would be obvious to go with a Mexican beer, uh, Modelo Negra jumped out at me. Turns out no, Modelo Negra is too low in alcohol content to float. And also it's not really black once you pour it out of that dark glass bottle. It's pretty light in color. Uh, so that ruined uh, the initial plan that I had for a two-tone cocktail. I asked a chemist friend, "How? what do you think I should do here to make this work? And he said, you know, it's tough to say, but look for the driest, highest ABV beer you can find. That might be a really good starting point. So I went to the liquor store, I put on my mask, <laughs> I wandered around suspiciously eyeing everybody else at the liquor store. I put on my mask and I went to the liquor store and I shopped around and what I found was the Lost Abbey Ag Ag uh, blah, 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 blah. Agave Maria Ale from the Lost Abbey is very dark in color and it's 13 and a half percent by volume. It is right at the edge of being less dense or more dense than the cocktail and it sort of mostly floats. Um, at the very least, when I've played with this before I shot it, I've managed to get a very nice gradient uh, from the bottom to the top. Another happy accident in testing this is that the uh, this is a shockingly delicious combination with this cocktail, to the point where I think it transcends being a video game drink adaptation. This should be served, this should be on menus or something. I don't know, you know, it would be an expensive drink to serve because this is not cheap, but oh my God, it's so good. I did think originally that using this beer would be a mistake thematically, but one of the core aspects of cyberpunk as a genre is the blending of various cultures of earth in really blunt, just like smash you in the face kind of ways. And this beer turns out to be perfect. It's a double style ale that's made with agave and aged in tequila barrels. So it's right there with our tequila old fashioned. Winds up very tart flavor profile that I think is a bit like a sour ale, though I'm not a beer expert and it doesn't say sour ale on the bottle. So maybe it doesn't really meet the definitions of a sour ale, but it's, it's fairly sour <laughs> nonetheless. Um, whatever this beer is, it's great in this, so let's make a Johnny Silverhand. The first thing I need to do is prepare the glass. I'm gonna serve it in. I need a lime wedge to do that, so I'm gonna take my, my knife and my cutting board here, and I'm gonna make just a wedge of lime. It doesn't have to be fancy at all because we're not doing much with this. This, the job of this lime wedge is, is pretty unimportant. Uh, it's just going, we're gonna take this and we're going to paint lime juice on the outside of this glass. And I'm gonna go with about a half of it. Uh, I'm gonna dip that into smoked chili pepper because as we know, this drink is served with a chili garnish, otherwise known as chipotle spice. 
my sipping glass aside. Okay, so next I need my mixing glass. I just got that from outer space. I forgot it. I hit cut. It appeared. It's magic. I need a mixing glass, and to that I'm going to add a little bit more than a quarter and a little bit less than a half of an ounce of simple syrup. So 15 milliliters for a half. I would go 10 milliliters if you're doing it that way. If you're metric land, I would say 12, you know. I think that uh, Dave Arnold would call this a fat quarter. Um, I'm just gonna split the difference in my jigger here, right between a quarter and a half. I have made this with Demerara simple syrup and it's fine, but there's a visual thing going on here. We wanna keep as much lightness in this drink as possible. And I think that it's just one of those cases where you should probably use a plain simple syrup two to one ratio. Then I'm gonna need a dash of Angostura bitters and a dash of orange bitters. Orange bitters up here in New Jersey. Um, and now I need two ounces of tequila. I am using uh, this tequila, La Gretona, uh, which is a 100% blue agave. Comes in this very rustic looking bottle. Uh, it's cheap, it's like $34 compared to my normal Fortaleza. Um, and uh, yeah, it was pretty good actually. I haven't had any complaints about this uh, with this drink. I'm also the only person who's drank this drink, so why would I complain about it? That would be a weird thing for me to do, complain about my own drink. But nonetheless, I haven't. So that's saying something, right? Yep. Cool. Next thing we need to do is stir this up with some ice. And now I've got a freezer over here. My life is so much better. See that? Great. I'm gonna crack some ice straight into here. Boom, boom, boom. Stir that up really well. Normally an old fashioned gets served over a big ice cube. In this case, we're gonna serve it up. I wanna make sure I'm doing all the dilution I might want, all the chilling I might want here in the mixing glass. So this is a case where you might stir this a bit longer than you normally would in old fashioned. Okay, next thing to do, strain this into the prepared glass. It's got this very light pink color from the Angostura bitters. I guess the orange is affecting it as well a bit. This is very fancy beer, so it comes in a champagne thing. Uh, with these guys, always point them away from anything you don't want to destroy. Ease the cork out. Done and done. Now, this is the critical phase of this drink. And even though I like to work back here for this, I have to bring it much closer to myself. It's a long reach to do that. Uh, so this is critical stuff here. Um, what you want to do is put this at the water level with the back of the spoon up. And now I want to hit the top of my bar spoon here and let it glide down the front of the bar spoon to the water level. And if we're all very lucky, this will sort of float. And by float, I mean, I'm not going to get like a New York sour look here. I'm hoping to get basically a nice gradient from the top to the bottom. And I think we've got it. Yeah, that's the look. Ooh, that's sick. Now, that's it. That is a tequila old fashioned with a bit more than a splash of cerveza um, and a chili garnish. The Johnny Silverhand. I did consider that a wedge of lime on this might be a nice addition and certainly would be thematically appropriate, but um, it's not called for, so I'm gonna skip it. Johnny Silverhand, bottoms up. Good God, that's so good. Oh my God, that's so good. It's so many flavors at once. It is the spicy chili and like dark chocolate. Actually, dark chocolate is really dominant up front and then cherry notes. I don't, I hear cherry a lot. People talk about cherry with a sour ale and this might be a sour ale. So maybe that's where the cherry is coming from. It might also be kind of a, a flavor memory. I used to work at a machine shop with a bunch of guys who were from a walk up and they would bring in like these um, dried candied fruits, cherries and stuff like that covered in chili. And it might just sort of remind me of that. That is unreal how good that is. It does taste like a dark chocolate, spicy cherry. I'm not exaggerating. That is like, if you had to wrap it up in three words, that's what it is, but you can pull it apart. You get the, the tequila, the agave. There's a, if it's smoke, it's not like a scotch smoke. It's like a very dark, bitter chocolate smoke. And of course, Chipotle is pretty smoky. <laughs> I went down the squiggly pipe as my kid likes to say. Oh man, woo. It's so good. It's an unbelievably good drink. So I got the dark chocolate, I got cherry spice, that smoky chipotle spice, and it does set your mouth on fire and it's wonderful. But the one nice thing is that um, if you prep this in advance, the lime and the chipotle really seat together and, and dry in a way that like a salted rim doesn't. So even though it looks like you're just putting pure chili powder in your mouth, which is fine, um, it's not as overpowering and, and it's not like eating a spoonful of chipotle like you might expect it to be. If you're into that kind of thing, you might like it anyway. It has this really cool light and dark layered look, which 
um, I think makes it very unique. And it's kind of reminds me of like a very, like I said before, like a very, very sophisticated boiler maker. Like who would, I, I would never occur to me to put a beer on top of an old fashioned, except for that, that drink in the video game. And then I had to make it good. And I think I, I feel like I did, I feel like I did. Oh yeah. And when you get into, when you start the tequila, you get the beer and Chipotle and the cherry and the chocolate first, but then that tequila comes through. Wow, that is really awesome. This really is a good drink. If not for the fact that that is in short supply, this would be something that would be like, I would have one of these every week. This would be, this is not, like I said, it's not just a prop drink. This is a genuinely wonderful cocktail. I am not tooting my own home. I hope you make it yourself. I am deeply impressed by it. Mm. It's, it's sweet. It is more sweet than you expect it to be. And maybe on one hand, I'm like, is it too sweet? I don't know, but I think it's not. I think it's not. I think if I made this less sweet, it would become too spicy. It would be, it would, it would become too harsh. The sugar that's in the old fashioned also, by the way, is changing the, the density of that portion of the drink to help our beer float. So that's a factor here. If we didn't have that in there, we'd probably get more of just a mix in a cloud. I don't think it would taste like cherry, for example. I don't think it would read that way as like a nice, almost like a cherry cordial, but not quite there. I don't think it would read that way without the sugar in there. So I like it this way. I mean, you might shave it back to like a flat quarter ounce and not a fat quarter ounce. That has a tempo to it. I don't think this is a drink that needs to be much drier than it is. My lips are on fire, but not in a way that I'm, I'm not like a spicy foods guy either. Like I'm not one of those people who wants to like, you know, eat the hottest hot wings on earth or anything like that. Unless by any chance you are um, a booker for hot ones, in which case I, I do. I love very spicy hot wings. I will go all the way. Well, let me put it this way. I'm not a person who loves jalapeno infused cocktails. I don't really like a spicy cocktail too much. I do love this. This is super duper good. And then you get into the tequila more so. It's really fun. You know, hypothetically, you could serve it along like with the beer and somebody could, you know, float it back up, top it back up as they go. But on the other hand, if you were running a bar, you could get um, a champagne cap for this and do a bunch of cocktails off of one of these. So maybe it's not such a, you know, maybe it's not such a, uh, a profits eater that I think it is. It's like a $16 bottle of beer though. It's like insanely expensive. <laughs> At least here in New Jersey. It's cherry chocolate spice, agave, tequila. What is the flavor of tequila? I mean, tequila tastes like tequila, you know? It's tequila. I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, at least for me, maybe I don't have the words for it. And it's very pretty. It is, sometimes I, I feel like sometimes I get it more right than others. And, and I don't want to gloat about it, but I feel like I got it right here. Okay, we're gonna move on from tasting notes time. 